<clears throat> Praise God, everyone. Um, good evening. It is February 27th. We're doing a devotional this evening for this week. And uh, I just want to say to those of you that this is a time of preparation. There's a lot of illustrations in the Bible about being prepared and those who were prepared and those who were not prepared and the outcomes for both parties of those that were prepared and those that weren't. Being the 27th day of the month, I want to read from Psalms 27. It is an exuberant declaration of faith, a Psalm of David. And it says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come up against me to consume my flesh, my enemies and foes will stumble and fall. And though an army may encamp around me or come against me, my heart will not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple for in time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Verse 11 of Psalm 27, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path, a smooth path, because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses will rise up against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart, Lord, unless I had believed, David said, that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And he instructs us, wait upon the Lord and be of good courage, for he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Praise God. Psalm 27. An exuberant declaration of faith. Praise God. My message tonight is, are you ready? Are you preparing for what is coming? No matter what we are dealing with today, and I, let's pray before we begin. I know there are people that are sick. Uh, there's colds going around. There's flus going around. There's various uh, type of uh, disease that's going around, including COVID apparently, and and I just want to pray for all of the body of Christ and for all of those that are soon to be in the body of Christ by faith. I pray that by the stripes of the Lord, we are already healed for those of us that are already under the, the canopy of his love and protective fold. But I also pray for those that are not, that Lord would heal them and bring them into a knowledge of the truth, removing the scales of blindness that would fall such that they would fall from their eyes and they would begin to see the truth and hear the truth and know the truth and that truth would make them free in Jesus' name. The Lord said that his disciples will obey his commands. His disciples will obey his commands. He also said that only those that do the will of the Father will enter into heaven. I want to make sure that I am doing the will of the Father at all times. And, and that's saying a lot because it's difficult with our lives being the way that our lives are constructed and formatted. But no matter what we are dealing with today, we have hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. Jesus addressed the issues at hand. He addressed what was going on in people's lives. He addressed things that people didn't want to talk about. He addressed the fact that there were people that were broken, that there were people that were hurting, that they were doing things that were sending them down the wrong path. And there were certain things, certain times and certain things where he called them out for their behavior, but he didn't leave them there. 
he provided a path of hope and restoration for them. And people today have real issues, but we have a real Jesus. And there is hope today for the hopeless. There is hope for the homeless. There is spiritual deliverance for those who are in spiritual bondages. There are There is sight for the spiritually blind. And there is something greater than simply attending a church somewhere. It's called new life in Christ. It's called being born again. It's called being buried with him in the likeness of his death and being resurrected in the likeness of his resurrection into a newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. People today are dealing with real stuff, real things. And we can pretend and hide from it, but it's still there. And people are facing stuff. And the answer for them lies in Jesus Christ. It resides and dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ten months or so ago, a prophetic word from the Lord went out. And it said this, I am calling my bride. I am gathering you together as a hen gathers her brood. I stand at the door and knock. Make your calling and your election sure, because I am soon to come. I'm sure many of you would say, in looking at all that is going on in the world today, that surely the Lord is soon to come, and that is true, and I believe sooner than later. We can't live like it's going to be later. We have to live and prepare like it's going to be sooner. There are many illustrations in the Bible about those who prepared and those who just delayed their preparing, and they missed out the ones that delayed their preparing. It's been recently said by men of God that change is coming. And it's going to be a change much like COVID that will get the world's attention. But this time, it won't be a disease. In John chapter 1 and verse 19, it speaks of John the baptizer, that the Jews sent priests and Levites out to ask him who he was. And he responded and said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. The wilderness can represent today's society, this world. It can represent America. It can represent the culture of our times. And John the baptizer wasn't the only one Jesus called to do what he did. Before we go on, and some of you may be bored at times by the amount of research that I do and the studying that I do, but scripture has got to be interpreted always in context of scripture. One of the biggest errors I find in misinterpreting scripture is what we would call contextual error. And what I mean by that is you have to look at the context. You have to look at the historical data. You have to look at the social times. You have to look at the cultural. You have to look at the grammatical because words can take on very different meanings from 2,000 years ago to today. We're talking about an ancient language that's been translated into modern language. And so you have to look at all of these things, the historical, the cultural, the social aspects, the grammatical aspects, and all of this context or scripture before you can make an assumption on interpretation. Because the problem is we can take modern context and place it into ancient context. And therefore, we come up with modern interpretations for ancient dialogue. And we read the Bible in low context, but they read it in high context. What do I mean by that? There's a lot of things in the Bible that when they wrote it, they assumed the reader already understood and knew what they were talking about. They didn't have to explain it to the reader because the reader had an understanding, they had an understanding, that the reader had a working knowledge. So here's an example. If I say, you know, it's great to go to the store today and see water on the shelves and see toilet paper on the shelves, you would understand what that's in reference to given the last 
couple of years, but somebody 20 years ago or 50 years from now may not have a clue what I'm talking about, why, what that reference is to. They wouldn't know why I said that without doing some research. And I'll admit at times, there are times when at times I, I thought I had something right and I've been a little bit off the of center, but I try to correct it as I realize that at times research isn't always as solid as we think it is whether you're looking in a Greek or Hebrew interliter, or you are looking up historical, cultural, social, grammatical information to try to get a better grasp and understanding of what they were talking about. John said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I don't know. Uh, if, if you don't know, I, I don't know if you don't know the word, but I will tell you this. If you do not know the word of God for yourself, you can be tricked and you can be deceived into believing something that isn't true and you can find yourself way off base. I've used an illustration in the past to talk about golfing and how uh, it's easy to hit a ball in golf off to the right or off to the left. And, and in golf, the objective is to hit the ball so that it lands in the middle of the fairway for best results to follow. And bowling is very similar to that in that you want the ball to move down the middle of the lane for best results. And I've been to golf stores where they have computerized training and they have backdrops where with a white center line on that backdrop, it looks like a, a fairway or maybe it's a green in the distance and it has a white center line so that you can see just how close or how far from that line you are with your ball that you hit. And in Christianity, there are so many different religions and so many different beliefs and some align with the center line of truth very closely to what is written, while others, they only align in part. For example, they may believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. They may believe that God is one, but then they get into believing that God is three persons, three different persons who are distinct from one another, and somehow they are co-equal, and they believe that these three persons are also co-eternal, and they'll even some say that Jesus is the eternal son. But even though none of that is found in the word of God, the Lord God didn't say it, Jesus didn't say it. The apostles didn't say it. The disciples of Christ didn't say it either. And true believers don't say it either because we go according to what is written. Infant christening, to praying to the dead, to confessing your sins to a guy in a box, to being baptized for the dead, knocking doors to earn your way to heaven. All of that stuff is not even in the same ballpark as the word of God. It comes from outer darkness. It does not come from the true light. And this is why it is so important to know what the word of God says so that you are staying close and true to the center line. They that teach those other things are far away from center. It's not a matter of, well, who's right. It's a matter of what's right. And the word of God is what is right. And the question is, how close to center are we? How close to center are they? If they're only close to the center line 5% of the time, say with the death and the burial and the resurrection, believing that God is one. But 95% of the time, they are way off track in a wide dispersion that's all over the place, like a golf ball that can be hit incorrectly. That's not a place where you want to go. It's not a place where you want to be. And you may say, well, they're up the middle on, on a couple of these things. Yeah, but so what? That's like me going out and hitting 100 golf balls and only five of them are in the center, but the other 95 are all over the place in the woods and in the lakes and in sand traps. That's not consistent, is it? The answer is no, that's not. It's all over the place. But if I learn to study correctly, if I learn to do it correctly, then I'm hitting 95 balls up the center line, close to center, and only five bad hits, perhaps. That's a whole lot better to have 5% of it off and 95% of it close to the truth than the other way around. And if you wanted to take golf lessons, let me ask you, would you take them from a person who 95% of their balls is landing in the woods and in the lakes and on Rocky Mountains and in sand traps all over the place? Or would you rather get your teachings from those who hit 95% 5% of them straight up the middle line. Most people of a sane mind would say they want to learn from the one who lands close to center or dead spot on the center every single time. In golf, if you hit too far to the right or too far to the left, 
they call it, you're going to get in, you can find yourself in trouble. If you land in a sand bunker, you're going to have to work really hard to get out of that, and you will lose distance in doing so. And if you land in the woods or in the lakes, you may never, you can lose everything. You may never recover your ball, and you may you may lose your, your ability to then uh, progress and, and lose the ball and incur penalties that will affect your outcome and your score. And while you're in those places, you can come up, you can get uh, poison ivy, you can get bit by spiders or snakes, you can tear your clothes and, on briars and get stickers and, on your clothing and even get mud all over you. Why would anybody want to get into a religion that's teaching stuff that's way off to the left or way off to the right or way off in the woods or the lakes or the sand traps and they are not teaching up the center that's the thing we want to look for. That's the thing we want to tell people that they need to strive for and look for. And it, the only way that you can know who is teaching stuff the majority of the time up center or close to center is to know what the word of God says beyond the basic death, burial, and resurrection because they're teaching stuff that's way beyond that. You've got to know more than just that. You've got to know whether it is book and whether or not it is of God. Hallelujah. And there are lots of free Bible versions available online today. Online today, free versions that might bless you in a wonderful way when the traditional versions may be difficult to understand. The Passion Translation is an easy read. It provides easy understanding. The Living Bible, just to name a few. Jesus said those that seek the truth will find it. Don't make excuses. Those that seek the truth will find it. Those that don't, won't. And I get that some people are poor readers. I, I understand that. But there are easy to read Bible versions out there that are online and that are free. You can go to Bible Gateway and there is a plethora of Bible versions available and you can pull them up simultaneously, as many I believe as eight at a time, and you can scroll down and they'll all scroll up for you and you can read across them and you can see and get an, a better understanding of what the Word of God, but you have to have a love for the truth. Those that have a love for the truth will find it. Those that do not have a love for the truth will simply make excuses. Now, from the last book of the Old Testament until the New Testament came along, there was what is called 400 years of silence. They hadn't heard anything for 400 years. And now this guy shows up saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And they're like, what? We've heard nothing for 400 years, and now some guy's standing out there in the wilderness saying, get ready, because he's going to show up. We don't know if we should believe you or not. Speaking of John the Baptist, during that 400 years of silence, there was a lot of political turmoil that happened. Alexander the Greek conquered Palestine and much of the area spread dispersing the Jews or spreading the Jews. And when Jesus talks about the lost sheep, it was talking about part of that dispersion of the Jews during that time. And when Alexander's Hellenization or Greek Hellenization, which is a fancy word for saying making everything Greek came in, it, it came to the point where some Jews forgot how to even read and speak Hebrew. And the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures had to then be translated into Greek, which is what we now call the Septuagint or Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament because of the change that had come and they had forgotten the original language, the original framework. And so we have this framework occurring when John the Baptist shows up. And they weren't looking for this kind of change. They weren't looking for that. They weren't looking for that kind of moment. They had the Greeks coming through and Romans coming through. And you had all kinds of political turmoil and internal turmoil taking place. And three different mindsets were formed that believed Messiah would come, but they weren't sure how it would happen. One of those groups was the Pharisees who believed if there was a strict adherence to the law, he would come because history had shown 
that being under the rule of someone else like they now were was because basically they messed up. And so the Pharisees said, look, we've messed up. We've all messed up. So here's how we're going to fix it. Everybody's going to live this perfect life and, and, and going to adhere to the perfection of the law. And to make sure that happens, we will add more stuff on top of it to make sure everyone is doing it. And that way, if they cross the line of stuff over there that we've added, at least they haven't crossed God's line. And if we do this long enough, God's going to say, okay, they're ready for me. I'm coming. The second group was called the Maccabeans, and they were a people that were revolutionaries. They believed that a revolt would restore, that a revolt would restore. It could be heard in the castle, somebody saying, sire, the people are revolting. And another voice would say, I know I can't stand them. And he's like, no, they really are revolting. Oh my Toss them a chicken. That's a joke. Anyway, but the Maccabeans believed that a revolt would restore everything. There are people today that honestly believe that war is the solution to bring peace. So there were the Maccabeans. There were the Pharisees, the Maccabeans. And then there was this third group that believed that he would come, Messiah would come as the conquering one. And the disciples kind of fell into this group because on their way to Jerusalem, when Jesus was about to be crucified, they're fighting about who's going to be in charge of what part of the government. Because they figured it's about to go down and we're going to Jerusalem and he's about to lay it all down because he's going to take over. They didn't understand. So there's the three groups, and John shows up and says, by the way, he's coming. And the majority missed it because they didn't see how it was going to happen. And there is a change coming, and we can be on the front of it, and it's intensifying. They all believed that Messiah was coming. But what divided them wasn't their theology. What divided them was their methodology. And all of them had a different understanding of how it was going to happen. And they didn't, again, they didn't mess up because of their theology. They messed up because they didn't get the methodology. And the change that is being prophetically spoken of as coming is going to affect the church's methodology today. And the warning is there are several aspects to change. There is a shift happening. Back in that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were both in error. They came out of the same womb, but they were different. The Pharisees were in error because they added to the word. The Sadducees took away from the word. And we have to be careful about the change in the change that's coming that we don't add to and that we don't take away, take anything away. Just like God gave Noah specific instructions on what to build and how to build it, God has given the church specific instructions on what to build and how to build it. I'm going to say that again. Just as God gave Noah specific instructions on what to build and how to build it, God has given the church, his church, specific instructions on what to build and how to build it. And we're in that place of change right now. There is a shifting going on right now, just like Noah was in a place of change. But the change he was involved in was directed by the Lord with specific instructions. And we can't afford to get stuck in our ways of doing things and miss it. Think about this. Jesus died about 33 to 35 AD. But the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 AD. That means for about 35 years or so, they continued to operate in the temple as they had. Even though the veil had been torn in two. I mean, there was physical evidence inside the temple that it changed had occurred, that a change had happened, and yet for 30-some years, they continued to do things their own ways, and they were so stuck in the way of doing things that they couldn't see it. 
We can't be married to our past so that we forget the shift that God is bringing about today. The point that I'm making is that there are some things that we hold so sacred that don't even come from the Bible, honestly. It's how we go about doing things, how we approach church, what we do when we come into church. And and we use some Bible verses. Some people use Bible verses to excuse the practice of the things that they're doing today. And they're married to their past. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're doing it now. This is how we're always going to do. What do you do when change comes? But what are we but what what we are doing is it even found in the Bible? I look at some things churches are doing today. I can't find it in the New Testament church. And I wonder if Peter or Paul or John showed up today. How much of what we do would they even recognize? And I get there's cultural things that are different today from back then. But again, how much would they recognize of what we're doing? Some have made changes in their methods. But the source behind it is still the same. Is it God or is it man? You know what's so scary about religious tradition? Religious tradition is is really, it's not about moving from legalism to freedom. Religious tradition really is anything that man's fingerprints are on that changes or distorts God's original intent for his church, his originality. Even the smallest of things, the smallest stuff, the adding to and the taking away from what God gave specific instructions for how he would build his church and how his church was to be. And just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both sides are equal and both sides are just as damning. And the question that we ought to be asking ourselves today is where is the source of what I'm doing? Where is the source of all of this? We, we, we can't let go of some of these things, you know, because it's part of our tradition. Where's the source of that coming from? We think of religious tradition as, as people that are rigid, but really it's anything that distorts God's original intent and his plan and his purpose for his ecclesia. People that follow religious tradition will miss what's coming because they're content to continue and follow in their own ways of doing things, such that when change comes, they will resist it and they will miss it. And this isn't about what what we want. It's about, or it should be about, really, what the Lord our God wants. Not adding to, not taking away from. There are prophets that believe today that a change is coming that is necessary. It is divine in its origin, and God is already moving, and he is dealing with individuals and groups, and I personally want to be a part of that change. I want to be a part of that number. I want to be a part of it his way. Jesus brought about change, but he brought about change by obedience to the Father. We have to be careful when we change, what we change, how we change. It's got to be directed by the Father. Change is coming. When is it coming? I don't know. I don't hear anybody saying exactly when it's coming. I'm not into market speculation, but change is coming. And it won't be rejected by the world. It will be rejected by the established churches, by those who claim to be followers of Christ, but they're following really after their own traditions. And people will gravitate, always people will gravitate toward what is real. They do not gravitate and they will not gravitate toward traditions, the same routines over and over and over again. Praise God. Praise God. Psalm 27 again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. 
whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to consume my flesh, my enemies and foes, they will stumble and fall. And though an army may encamp around or against me, my heart will not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple for in time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion and in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me and he shall set me upon a rock and my head will be lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle and I will sing yea I will sing praises to the Lord oh hallelujah Thank you, Jesus, for an exuberant declaration of faith by David, where he goes down to verse 11 and says, Teach me your ways, O God. Lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, and I might include there my flesh. For false witnesses will rise up, God, and breathe out violence, and we would lose heart unless we had believed that we would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And he closes out Psalm 27 saying, wait on the Lord, prepare, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, David says, on the Lord. If you take a look at John the Baptist, one crying in the wilderness, how many John the Baptist has the Lord desired of us to be one's crying in the wilderness, saying the words of John the baptizer, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He is coming. Prepare ye the way. We pray, Lord of the harvest. If we pray, Lord of the harvest, send forth laborers into the harvest. That would be us. That would be us. And we have to be like John the baptizer, preparing the way for him that is coming in Jesus' name. Just 10 months ago, he said, I am calling my bride. I'm gathering you together as a hen gathers her brood. I stand at the door and knock. Make your calling and your election sure because I am soon to come. I am soon to come. John said he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. In order for the world to get straight ways to the Lord, the church has got to get on the straight way to the Lord. And I'm not talking about believing a few verses and key things in the Bible. I'm talking about practicing and doing as God's original plan and intent was for his church. Read the word of God, read the book, read the book of Acts, read the New Testament, and you will see what God's plan and what God's purpose and what God's method was and the methodologies that God put in place. And we have to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord to hear if he begin, as he begins to instruct us in the methods that we need to change and that we need to get pre preparing ourselves. Just like the five wise and five foolish virgins, just like those in Noah's day, some prepared themselves correctly, some did not. We cannot be procrastinators in preparing ourselves in this last hour because we are living in this last hour in Jesus' name. And excuses are not going to fly. They never have. They never will. It's time for the church to come together. We talk about a book of Acts church. To be a book of Acts church, we've got to do what the church in the book of Acts did. If we want to get what the book of Acts church got, we got to do what they did to get what they got. We have to pray like they prayed. We have to believe like they believed. We have to live like they lived. We have to speak like they spoke. We have to hear like they heard. We have to come together like they came together. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Praise God. There's a lot of turmoil. During the 400 years of silent years, a lot of turmoil, political turmoil happened, but there was also internal per turmoil, and there was a lot of things that were being conquered. The church needs to be doing some conquering or doing a lot of conquering because the enemy is moving in, and we see it. 
We see it in our schools. We see it influ influencing and affecting our children. Where's the church? Where's the binding and the loosing? Where's the, the warriors of God? Praise God. What group are we in? What group are we in? God forbid we be in the group of the Pharisees. God forbid we be in the group of the Sadducees. God forbid we simply be revolutionaries like the Maccabeans. God forbid we miss it because we're too focused on our own methodologies of how we come nonchalantly to church, to care group, to Bible studies. <laughs> Look at your heart, friend. This is a message calling out. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's to all of us. Are we prepared for what is coming? Are you prepared for what's coming? Praise God. I love you all. Uh, don't know if this challenges you to examine yourself, but this would be a great time to examine yourself. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness in Psalm 29. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Set yourselves apart unto the Lord like never before. This is the time we need to prepare and we need to take a look at what we're doing in our methods, in our traditions, and ask ourselves, is this of God? Is this what the Lord, where, is this where the Lord wants me to be doing what I'm doing right now? Are these the methods of God or are these the methods of men? Trying to adjust to an ever-changing culture. The world has their ideas. It doesn't matter what they have. Though the world may pass me by, go their way, let me be. Just to walk with him means everything to me. Let that be your song. Just to walk with him means everything to me. Just to know he's there, that his hand is leading me. Not me leading myself. His hand is leading me. Yeah, let the world go their way. Pass me by, go their way. Just to walk with the Lord means everything. Today. Today. Now is the time of preparing. I love you all. I'll see you next week. And uh, hopefully more will tune in. And I hope this is a blessing to someone such that it would cause us to examine ourselves and say, Lord, am I following the path that you want me to be following? Am I, am I, are my methodologies pleasing to you? Am I missing it? Have I been so married to my ways of doing things that I'm no longer doing the things you want me to do? In Jesus' name. Love you all. I'll see you next week. Go and be a blessing to somebody. Share your testimony and be as John the Baptist, preparing the way of the Lord as one crying in the wilderness saying, make straight the way of the Lord.